Dr. Virginie Roy is a marine biologist in the Earth Kennedy Museum of Nature, and she's recipient of the W. Garfield Weston Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship for Arctic Research. Dr. Roy is an expert on the subject of marine invertebrates from the Canadian Arctic. These creatures live on or near the seafloor, an area known as the bed plus. Please welcome Dr. Roy. Thanks to uh, thanks Don for the presentation and thanks to people here in Ottawa and thanks to uh, people following the presentation in Vancouver. So today I'm with, I'm going to talk about the Arctic benthic ecosystems. I know that I'm not the first uh, speaker talking about benthas in this series uh, of, uh, of the marine life course given by the Vancouver Aquarium, but I will make sure in my presentation that I will give you new information about the benthas. So in that presentation, I will present mostly what I did during my PhD project, and I will present you also what I'm doing here at the Canadian Museum of Nature. So on each of the slides of my presentation, you will have always the, the plan of the presentation at the top of the slide. So in this uh, presentation, I will talk first about basic concepts of the marine uh, Arctic environment. I will also tell you what is the importance of the baseline data on Arctic benthic diversity. And I'm going to talk also about the environmental drivers of this uh, Arctic benthic diversity. And I'm going to talk also more deeply about one of the drivers, the food spot, why it is important for the benthas in the Arctic. And then I will conclude my presentation about uh, by talking about conservation issues that we have on the benthas, considering that we are in a changing Arctic. So here you have a map of the, of the Arctic Ocean in the center and with around it all the marginal seas, the Arctic seas. So the Arctic is a vast territory and is shared uh, between the different Arctic states. So for example, Canada and Alaska are sharing together some of the Arctic, along with Greenland, European countries and Russia. So today I'm going to, uh, the presentation will be focused on the Canadian Arctic, where I did uh, my project during my PhD in London where I'm doing right now also my project as a postdoctoral fellow. So I want to show you how in Canada we define the Canadian Arctic marine environment, where are the limits of the territory. So here on this map you see in dark blue what is the definition by fisheries and ocean of Canada. At the western edge you have the Beaufort Sea that we share with Alaska. And in the center, you see the high numbers of islands that we have, and it's why we call the central part of the Canadian Arctic the archipelago. Then at the eastern edge, you have Baffin Bay that we share with Greenland, and then at the southern limit, uh, you see Hudson Bay, uh, the Hudson Bay complex with James Bay and Hudson Strait. So you see that the, the marine environment of Canada is very vast. And if you just consider the total distance of the coastline around all the islands of the archipelago, the total distance is about 162 kilometers, which is four times the Earth's circumference. So can you imagine how can we survey all the diversity that lives on that coastline? It's so huge, so vast. And here I would like to present you again, maybe, the, the marine food web of the Arctic with it's a primary producer and with its consumers. So in the Arctic seas, uh, as primary producers, we have the sea ice algae. They are attached to the ice. They are specific to the polar seas because we, we need ice to grow. And we have also the pelagic algae. They are uh, free floating algae in the water column. And they are not attached to the uh, sea ice, so they are different species. And the consumers in the food web are the zooplankton, the fish, the and marine mammals. And they are all connected together uh, throughout many connections. And it's why we, we call it the food web and not the food chain. But we should not forget that at the bottom of that marine food web, we have the bantas in the orange rectangle. So the bantas is a very vast uh, assemble of organisms, invertebrate animals. And they are very rich in terms of numbers of species. And uh, currently, uh, we know that the benthas includes 90% of all the richness of the Arctic flora. So really, it's a very, very diverse um, compartment of the ecosystem. So 
Also, I want to draw your attention that the venta is not isolated from the rest of the Google. It is connected to the to the water column. And the water column is connected also to the ventas. I will show you that in the next slide. So the venta is connected to the water column because it has to receive the food from the water column. And here I want to show you three main sources of food for the venta in the in the Arctic environment. So first you have the sea ice algae. Uh, the, the sea ice algae usually they are very large in size and heavy, so they can sink rapidly to the sea floor. You have also the pelagic algae. Uh, they are usually they are smaller in size and not as heavy as the sea ice algae, but they can sink also uh, to the sea floor. And even though if the zooplankton eat first the algae with their fecal pellets, they will be able to feed also the the, the, the venta because the fecal the fecal pellets they will sink to the sea floor. So really, you have to see that as a range of organic matter particles that is sinking to the sea and feeding the ventas. And within the ventas, they don't eat the same way the organic matter. Some of them are uh, deposit feeders, so it means that they have to ingest the sediment to uh, get their organic matter. Some of them are suspension feeders. It means that they have to filter the water to uh, ingest the organic matter. And others are predators, so it means that they have to eat their members, so the other animals living around them. And the mantas is a source of food for other animals. A, a high number of marine mammals uh, love the seafood, and it's why they dive under the ice to eat the mantas. So, for example, you have the beluga, the bearded seal, the walrus, the narwhal, and the gray whale. And among the seabirds, you have the common eider here at the left. Uh, so they are well known to dive under the ice and to feed on mats of mussels and urchins. And they have very strong digestive system, so they can swallow entire urchin. And I cannot do that, but can, they can do it, <laughs> for sure. So as you may know already, the Arctic is changing, and it is changing very fast. So the image at the top of the slide shows you how the, um, the sea ice extent is decreasing over years. So from the past to the present and to the future predictions. So in the, in, by the mid the century of our present century, we expect that uh, the multi-year ice extent will be uh, extinct. So they will no, the, the ice during the summer will not be there anymore. So it means that with more open water um, areas in the summer, we're going to see some impacts on the marine ecosystems, but we're going to see also some impacts on human activity. And by saying impacts, I'm not saying that it's bad or good. I'm just saying that it's going to create opportunities and risks for both the marine ecosystems and both the human activities. But uh, the Arctic is changing so fast. At a time that we sometimes we don't have the time to evaluate what is the current status of the ecosystem. And how? What is the current status of the diversity? So, for example, in one of the study that I did during my PhD, we were interested to know uh, for the Canadian Arctic, do we know enough about the diversity, the richness of the megaventa? So, here in that study, we only uh, looked at the megaventa, so the very large uh, benthic organisms. And the the main result of that study showed that we just know three percent of the diversity in the Arctic the Canadian Arctic for the Bay of diversity. So it means that we need to do more sampling because we don't know 50% of the, of the richness currently. And at the top of the slide, I just want to tell you a little bit what you are uh, seeing right now. At the left, you have a basket star, then a soft pearl, a brittle star, a sea star, and then crinoids. So all of them are very large ventas benthic organisms, and they are included in the big benthic category. So here at the Canadian Museum of Nature, I still work on baseline data to, to know more about the benthic diversity. I'm creating a big database uh, with all the, the marine benthic Arctic data that the museum has in its uh, specimen collection. So it's over 100 years of Arctic data. So it's going to be a very large database that will be made available electronically for uh, other scientists that are working on the, on the diversity in the Arctic. So here we can see on this map all the records, more than 6,000 records that we have right now in the specimen collection of the museum. 
And so all the information associated with those reports, they will be, they will be made uh, available for, um, for the public and for scientists. So I work also um, outside of Canada on baseline data. Usually as scientists, we, we more, more often within our country boundaries, our, within our national borders. But it's also nice when we can share with other Arctic researchers our knowledge on the, on the diversity of the marine uh, ecosystem of the Arctic. So I'm involved in a program called the Circum Polar Biodiversity Monitoring Program under CAF and the Arctic Council. And when we meet together with all the other researchers, we are sharing our knowledge on the vent of diversity, but also on other kind of diversity, marine mammals, seabirds, uh, algae, so plankton. And we are writing right on a report that, that is going to be released in 2017. And in that report, we're going to state what is our current knowledge about the diversity of the, uh, the Arctic diversity. So besides knowing what is the current uh, diversity for the Ventus, we have to do at the same time, we have to do some research to know what drives the diversity of species composition. So for example, in this diagram, you have the Benta diversity at the center, and around it, you have some of the main environmental variables that will drive the species composition. So for example, if we only take the substrate uh, at the top here, um, if you are a benthic organism, you will, not be, you will not find the same species on the soft bottom than on a hard uh, bottom. Because on a, on a soft bottom, on a soft a substrate a zipper, you will have to ingest the sediment to get your organic matter. But if you live on a hard substrate, you will live on rocks. So you won't have access to the sediment. You will have to filter the water to get your organic matters. So the deposit feeders, they are not the same species as the suspension feeders. And so the substrate is really controlling the species composition at some places in the Arctic. And also in the world of shape. So in a study that I did during my PhD again, we wanted to know what are the drivers, the main drivers of the mega ventus community in the, in, across the Canadian Arctic. And so we did some statistical analysis between the species composition of the mega ventus and environmental drivers. And we ended up with six mega ventus communities with different habitats. So the first community that we have in the Canadian Arctic waters for the mega ventus is a, a community only located on the Mackenzie Shelf. Why we have this specific community here on the Mackenzie Shelf in the Beaufort Sea is because of the great influence of the Mackenzie River. So the Mackenzie River with uh, the freshwater content and the sediment uh, content uh, is really controlling uh, a specific uh, community that is living there. The second community that we have, we call it uh, the deep cold spot, is because uh, the community is there, they are living in the deep areas of the Amazon Gulf in a place where they don't receive a lot of uh, food. And so the community there is not so rich. And, it, and the density and the biomass is really low because they don't have enough food. We have another community called the deep sub substrate. So that community lives in deep areas again, but where the food is more uh, abundant, and they are living on sub substrate. And we have also a community called the hard substrate. So the species composition is really specific to that kind of habitat because they are living on rocks in, in areas where the currents are very high. Also, we have a community called the shelf break. This is a community at the transition between the shelf and the slope in the Canadian Arctic. Again, really specific species composition. And the final one, uh, we called it local hotspots because at those places in the Canadian Arctic, the, it's where we observe the highest richness in the habitat and also the highest biomass in density. So we think that we should monitor more closely those hotspots in the future, considering the climate change, because we're going to see those hotspots if they will uh, stay stable or if they will decrease or increase in the future, considering the climate change. So why it is important to know what drives the diversity of species composition is because when you know that, then after you can more carefully monitor the environmental change and its impact on the system. So you have first to know what is driving the ecosystem before to, uh, before to look at how the, the climate change can impact the ecosystem. So 
Now I'm going to talk more deeply about one of the drivers, the food supply. And when I'm, when I'm talking about food supply, I, I want to say that I'm considering uh, the quantity of food that the vendor is receiving. Is it a high quantity or low quantity of food? And I want to consider also the quality of food. Is it high quality or low quality of food? So the current view that we have for the food supply for the Benthos in the Arctic, in general, and particularly for the Canadian Arctic, we have it presently a very high energy flux from the surface because of the algae to the Benthos. So we have a strong export of organic matter to the Benthos. So currently, uh, we have the sea ice algae and the uh, pelagic algae. They, they are in high density and high biomass. And they are not uh, eaten so far by too much of plankton, so they can sink rapidly to the seafloor, and then it will, the algae will be available for the plankton, and it's why we, we can see high biomass and high richness of plankton. But when we see this kind of uh, conceptual uh, view of the system purely, we have to understand really what is the importance of the sea ice algae for the plankton. So I did a study during my PhD to know what is the importance of sea ice algae in the benthos diet and to answer the question of what is the main source of carbon for benthos, we looked at the stable carbon isotopic ratio signature. Why we looked at the carbon is because it's one of the main constituents of the body as an animal and it's also the, the main constituent of the body of the benthos. So we looked specifically at the carbon isotopic ratio signature because we know that the food sources, they have distinct signatures. For example, we know what is the value in, for that, for the carbon isotopic ratio signature for the sea ice algae, and we know also what is the, the value for the pelagic algae. So when measuring the carbon in the benthos, you will know what, what do they eat uh, before. And so the main result of that study showed that across the Canadian Arctic, the main source of carbon for all the benthic organisms is coming from sea ice algae. So it means that currently, uh, sea ice algae is the main part of their diet for benthos. It means that sea ice algae, it means also that they are connected to the ice. So we don't know in the future, considering the, the reducing of the size extent, we don't know what will, how the benthos will adapt to that, but for sure we have to monitor uh, how the, the benthos could adapt to the decrease in sea ice and to the decrease in sea ice algae. So this is uh, more like before I presented what is the our current view of the energy flux from the surface to the bottom for the benthos, and what do we expect for the future? So we expect a weaker export of algae to the benthos. Why? Because with the melting of sea ice that will happen earlier in the spring summer, and because we expect that the bloom of algae will arrive later in the, in the season, at a time where and when the zooplankton will be there to eat the algae, then it means that we're going to have less algae available on the seafloor for the benthos. So we expect that in the future we're going to see uh, less, um, less benthos on the seafloor at some places in the Arctic. So the decreasing in sea ice is one of the threats to benthos, but this is another threat <coughs> for the benthos. As this summer sea ice extent is decreasing in the Arctic, the vessels are going north because, for example, the ground fish plotters, they are going north because uh, there is an abundance of fish in the Arctic. And, but this kind of vessel, they are a threat to the benthos because they are targeting the fish that live near or close to the sea floor. And so by that, by uh, fishing those, uh, those, those fish at the bottom of the, the ocean, they are also destroying the benthos. And we know that because this is something happening in the world ocean. But we are facing maybe the, the same problem for the Arctic in the upcoming years. So even if we know that uh, brown fish waters can have a negative impact on benthos, at some places, uh, fishermen and fisheries and oceans can have the are taking good and positive uh, management decisions to stop fisheries in some places where they have a concern about the ecosystem living there. So this is an example in the central part of Baffin Bay where they are fishing for Greenland halibut. But at this 
same location, there is also a very high concentration of cold water pools. Yes, we can have corals in deep and dark uh, waters. So the corals, they are not only found in tropical and warm waters, they can be found in the Arctic. And particularly in the Daphne Bay, uh, there is a very high uh, density of corals, not only in this location, but also uh, around Daphne Bay. And so at a specific location also, it's a, it's a winter uh, area for nobles. So because it was so stressful for many uh, eco components of the ecosystem, they decided to stop to fish at that particular place to protect the corals and to protect the nobles. So even if, yeah, as I said before, even if they are going there to fish at some point, if they have good information that it can be a threat to the ecosystem, they will stop to fish. So where else in the Canadian Arctic do we have enough good information to tell that there is maybe a concern for the ecosystem? So here on this map, you, sh you see in, the, in all the dashed areas, in black and in red, all the areas that we call the ecologically and biologically significant areas, uh, EPSA. And those EPSA they were defined in 2011 by Fisheries and Oceans Canada by a group of scientists working on marine mammals, on seabirds, zooplankton, and algae. And all together, they defined some areas where we have enough information to tell the government that they are um, they are ecologically and biologically significant. So this, the, these areas, they don't have a status of conservation. We just have the information on this map. So, but it's a, it's a key component for the development of ecosystem-based management. And this kind of information helps to make a management decision, especially ecosystem-based management decisions. But you, we have to, to be aware that this map maybe will change in the future, considering the climate changes. Because in a changing Arctic, we need to re-evaluate often uh, the location of those exiles. And, and because we have re evaluation they are necessary and critical to provide the best available information at any time. So I will finish my presentation with open questions because this presentation is part of a, of a course. So I would like, I, I want to be sure that if you want to do homeworks when you go back home, you can do some homework. So I will leave some open questions to you. So first, uh, the, the first question is, what are the functional roles of VENTA in the Arctic Marine Food Grant? I've presented some of the functional roles, but uh, I didn't have the time to, to present all the functional roles of VENTA in the Arctic Marine Food Grant, so you can look for more information about that. Uh, secondly, the second question is how the Arctic Marine Food Grant differs from the Antarctic one. The course here was dedicated to the Arctic, but uh, there are some differences, but some also uh, similarities uh, between uh, the Arctic Marine Food Grant and the Antarctic one. So this is something that you can look more uh, later. The third question is what are the predicted opportunities and risks for human activities and for marine ecosystems in a changing climate. For example, I will give you an insight for an, an opportunity for marine ecosystem, because it's sometimes it's hard to, to know which kind of opportunity can arrive with climate change. But the Arctic system is very close to the boreal systems. So as the, the, the Arctic is warming, and as the sea ice is diminishing in the Arctic, more boreal species are going north. And for them, it's an opportunity because their range extension is increasing. So that could be an, an opportunity for them. The final question is how to manage an ecosystem under stress, especially considering that uh, currently the Arctic marine food web is under stress by multiple stressors. So I've talked about the, uh, the impact of the declining sea ice, and I've talked about the impact of increasing fisheries in the Arctic. If we add with that the increasing of the water temperature and the acidification, then we have an ecosystem that is really stressed by multiple stressors. And so we could ask ourselves, how can we manage an ecosystem that is facing so many stress? So I would like to thank all the organizations and foundations that help um, 
that help the largest bank and with money to uh, to do to help me and uh, to do all the projects that I've done during my PhD and, I, and the project that I'm doing now on the Canadian Thank you.